Hi, my name is Hedy, and today I'm talking to you from the Champalamo Foundation in Lisbon, where I do neuroscience research. My interest in the brain began at school, and I can still remember the day when I learned that our experience of color is a fabrication. Color is not a direct property of matter. Instead, it's an invention, a useful trick conjured up by our brains as a way of distinguishing light with different wavelengths. Different brains see different things. For example, what looks like a yellow flower to us looks very different to a butterfly that can see ultraviolet light. The reds and greens and yellows that we see in the world around us are not really out there, but in here. That day at school left a big impression on me and perhaps it's no surprise that I now spend my days trying to understand how the brain computes vision. But as we'll see, the brain fabricates not just our visual experience, but also our entire perception of the world, even our perception of who we are. A good analogy for how we are deceived by our brains is Plato's allegory of the cave. The ancient Greek philosopher imagines a cave where people have been imprisoned from birth and can only look at the wall in front of them, unable to turn their heads. Behind the prisoners is a fire. Objects pass in front of the fire and the prisoners mistake the shadows on the wall for the actual objects themselves. Similarly, we are prisoners of our own conscious experience but most of the time, not even aware of it. I study the cortex, which is the wrinkled outer layer of our brains that you can see in cross-section here. The visual cortex lies at the back of our brains, and you can think of it as the projector playing those shadows on the wall, creating those illusory colors and shapes that we mistake for reality. Optical illusions help us see more clearly how this remarkable projector works. In this image, the color of square A looks very different to the color of square B. But actually, the colors of these two squares are exactly the same. Illusions like this one show that our visual perception of the world is not a faithful representation of reality. Rather, it's an interpretation. Our brains have built an internal model of the outside world. Our cortex assumes that a shadow darkens the surface that it is cast upon. So it compensates by making square B seem lighter than it really is, even though these two squares reflect exactly the same amount of light to our eye. It's clear from this illusion that the brain is not a camera. It doesn't passively record the world. Instead, it actively constructs it based on prior expectations. Why would it do this? Well, our brains evolved to find patterns in our environment and to associate those patterns with behavior useful for survival. The ability to detect a face behind the bushes could literally be a matter of life and death. Indeed, we're especially prone to seeing faces, even where there are none. Take an everyday object like a power socket, and we immediately discern a face. Not only that, we can even discern an emotion. But unlike this power socket, we shouldn't be surprised. Being able to rapidly identify faces and mental states of others would have been a useful evolutionary trait. Even if having that ability sometimes means you see a face in the cloud or in your washing machine. So it seems that our perception of the world comes as much from the inside out as from the outside in. The fact that our brains can be tricked by illusions or see false patterns doesn't make it dumb. On the contrary, we may see faces in power sockets and washing machines, but we still manage to invent them. 
And after all, the brain's job isn't to help us see reality as it really is. The brain's job is to help us survive and reproduce in a complex environment. Or to put it another way, perception is not about seeing truth, it's about having kids. The brain doesn't just construct the outside world, it constructs our inner worlds too. We feel that we can freely act and make decisions, but this too is an illusion. In one study, for example, researchers asked people to make decisions inside a brain scanner. By looking at activity in the frontopolar cortex, just behind our foreheads, researchers could predict what choice people would make before they themselves were even conscious of having made a decision. These findings suggest that our brain can make up its mind as much as 10 seconds before you do. But you don't need a $1 million brain scanner to show that our decisions must be made before we become consciously aware of them. To illustrate this, let's take uh, a typical thought that you've probably had many thousands of times, one you might even be having right now, such as, I'm going to check my phone. Most of us believe that first we think the thought and then we act on it. But in fact, that's not what happens. The thought of wanting to check your phone is preceded by and caused by brain activity that you're not consciously aware of. And that's true of every thought we've ever had. I'm no more conscious of the activity of the cells in my brain causing me to say this sentence than I am of the activity of the cells in my liver. This contradicts the general belief that the conscious self is the originator of our thoughts. In actuality, it's the recipient. Indeed, our conscious self commits an act of plagiarism every moment of every day, claiming ownership of thoughts and actions that it did not create. If we agree that all thoughts are caused by preceding brain activity that we are not consciously aware of, then we have to conclude that our conscious self no more causes our thoughts than it causes our dreams. Our sense of free will can even be manipulated in the operating room. When surgeons electrically stimulated a frontal motor area of the cortex in patients undergoing brain surgery, the patients reported having a conscious intention or urge to move a specific part of their body. More intense stimulation evoked actual movement of this body part, such that the patients experienced ownership of the movement. This shows that we can be made to experience actions as voluntary, not just when they are internally generated by our unconscious brain, but even when they are externally imposed by a brain surgeon. Importantly though, the opposite can also be true. Patients with schizophrenia may experience their thoughts and actions as being involuntary and controlled by an external agent when they are not. Consider the following quote from one such patient. They inserted a computer in my brain. It makes me turn to the left or right. It's just as if I were being steered around by whom or what I don't know. Unsurprisingly, the feeling of not being in control of our thoughts and actions can be severely debilitating. Just as our color vision helped us to find food and avoid predators more easily, so too this illusory sensation we have of being in the driving seat rather than in the passengers may well have conferred an evolutionary advantage. Perhaps that is why it's so hard for us to let go of this illusion. We have still not fundamentally changed the way we see ourselves as freely acting agents any more than our primate cousins. This despite the fact 
that people have discarded the notion of free will for centuries. Take this quote from the 19th century, for example. The general delusion about free will is obvious. Or this quote from the 20th. Human beings in their thinking, feeling, and acting are not free, but are as causally bound as the stars in their motions. The first quote is by Charles Darwin, the second by Albert Einstein. Yet here in the 21st century, the vast majority of humanity would not agree with their sentiments. But why does it matter that we understand that we are not free agents? Well, the belief that we are has very real practical consequences and permeates every aspect of our society, from the classroom to the courtroom. It underpins everything from our own feelings of self-worth to the principles of meritocracy. Our concepts of reward and punishment, credit and blame are built upon it. Indeed, the ethos of most criminal justice systems continues to be punishment because you deserve it, rather than rehabilitation because you don't. And we have an amazing capacity and desire to assign agency to other humans, and not just to other humans. Throughout the Middle Ages in Europe, domestic animals such as cows and horses were commonly arrested and put on trial for committing crimes against man. The accused animal would often be granted legal aid in the form of a lawyer who would speak in their defense. Take the case of a trial in 15th century France of a female pig and her six piglets. The pig was found guilty of infanticide and sentenced to death by hanging, but her piglets were found not to be complicit in her crime and were instead exonerated, partly because they were deemed to be too young to be responsible. Now, you may laugh at this, but then ask yourself this question. Have you ever felt anger towards your computer when it suddenly crashed or didn't behave as you expected? I'm guessing the answer is probably yes. So if we're capable of assigning free will to a microprocessor made in a factory in China, that should immediately be raising alarm bells right there. At least a pig is a living thing and not an inanimate object. Perhaps another reason for why it's so hard for us to accept that we don't have free will is that it's ingrained not just in our biology, but in our culture, even in our language. To say, I thought this or you did that, carries with it the inherent presumption that we are the creators of our thoughts and the instigators of our actions. It's also more convenient to say, I achieved a high score in the exam, than the more accurate phrase, my brain obeyed the laws of physics, leading me to receive a high score in the exam. Indeed, different languages can shape how we think about causation and agency differently. When describing this accident, for example, in English, you could say, he broke the vase. Whereas in Spanish, you might be more likely to say the vase broke or the vase broke itself and dropped the agent of causality. Interestingly, the researchers found that English speakers were more likely to remember who caused an accident than Spanish speakers and less likely to remember that it was an accident. This suggests that our language can influence the way we think about blame and punishment. So what does all this mean? How can we reconcile ourselves with the fact that our conscious self is no more responsible for the thoughts it thinks than the colors it sees? Well, I think a world without credit and blame can actually be a more compassionate one. For example, Darwin said that acknowledging our lack of free will should teach one profound humility. One deserves no credit for anything nor ought one to blame others. Einstein said that this awareness kept him from losing his temper with other people. Speaking for myself, I find it much harder to feel negative emotions like anger and resentment towards other human beings 
than I once did. And I think that this view can make us feel better about our failings and more humble about our successes. Ironically, it may be more liberating to know that we are prisoners than to keep pretending that we are not. Because, unlike the prisoners in Plato's allegory, we can at least turn our heads and know that those shadows dancing on the wall are not real objects. <laughs>